20 years ago, the world watched in shock as the Space Shuttle Columbia broke apart upon re-entry, killing all seven crew members. Columbia, Houston, comm check. GC flight. Fly GC, lock the doors. The morning of February 1st, 2003, was to be the return of a dedicated science space shuttle mission that had been ongoing for two and a half weeks. The disaster forced NASA to reevaluate its safety culture and changed the trajectory of the agency's human spaceflight program forever. In this video, I want to take a moment to remember the sacrifice of the Columbia astronauts and reflect on the legacy of that devastating event and how it put NASA on a path to return people to deep space for the first time since 1972 under the Artemis program. Interestingly, all three of NASA's major space tragedies have occurred in roughly the same week of the year, the other two being Apollo 1 on January 27, 1967, and Challenger on January 28, 1986. Every year, NASA designates a day of remembrance for ceremonies. In 2023, it's January 26th. It's crazy that it's already been 20 years since the Columbia accident. Like many of you, I remember exactly where I was when I heard about the accident. My mom, for some reason, initially hid the news from me. On one hand, I get it, but on the other hand, I was 14. It's not like I wasn't going to find out. It was a Saturday, but I found out about it before lunch. At this point in my life, I was already interested in space, but nothing was solidified. It was the STS-107 mission that made me want to do something with my life involving space. I remember obsessing with the reports of the accident in the weeks and months to come. I even made an 80-page PowerPoint slide in my computer class about Columbia and all her missions. I saved it on a 3.5-inch floppy drive here, which only had 1.44 megabytes of storage. Remember these? I haven't used this in nearly 20 years, so I don't even know if the file still survives on this thing. Let me know if you'd be interested in me doing a live stream someday going over a bit of my past. Could be interesting. Anyway, this event changed the course of my life just like it changed the course of human space exploration. STS-107's crew included Rick Husband, William McCool, David Brown, Kapana Chawa, Michael Anderson, Lauren Clark, and Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon. This was the 28th flight for Columbia, which was also used to fly the very first space shuttle mission in 1981. The crew's mission was to spend some 16 days in low Earth orbit conducting a multitude of international science experiments. It was a long-delayed and rare-for-the-time solo science mission that was scheduled between International Space Station construction flights. I won't get into the nitty-gritty details about the accident, but in a nutshell, about 82 seconds into its launch on January 16th, a piece of foam fell off the bipod foam ramp on the external tank. That's the area where the nose of the orbiter was attached. That foam, which was later determined to be about the size of a briefcase, fell with such a velocity low enough in the atmosphere that when it struck the left wing leading edge, it put a hole in the orbiter's heat shield. But nobody knew it at the time. During a post-launch analysis on the strike, in the days after liftoff, there were a lot of unknowns about how big it was and exactly where it struck the orbiter. Was it the underbelly, or was it the stronger reinforced carbon-carbon on the wing leading edge? Imagery of that location didn't exist, and while it was theoretically possible that an on-orbit military satellite may have been able to image the spacecraft, that request was ultimately denied because of a lack of evidence for a need to do so by mission managers. Either way, there was a debate about whether the foam would have done any significant damage. Foam debris had impacted the thermal protection system before, and NASA didn't have any problems. Debris shedding was a known and acceptable risk for shuttle flights. Ultimately, mission managers concluded that there was no cause for concern about any damage to the heat shield and informed the crew as such. There's a lot more to this story, but that's the short version. Regardless, when Columbia began re-entering Earth's atmosphere to come home on February 1st, superheated gas was able to enter the wing of the orbiter. Ultimately, contact with the vehicle and her crew was lost at 8.59 a.m. Eastern Time. It broke apart over eastern Texas while traveling faster than Mach 15, more than 60 kilometers above the ground. According to a 2008 report about crew survivability, there was a period of about 40 seconds between the loss of control of the spacecraft and cabin breakup and depressurization, causing them to lose consciousness. I'll link to that report below, but needless to say, the events of the breakup were lethal. The Columbia and her crew were just 16 minutes away from landing in Florida. Immediately after the accident, NASA formed the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, and a multi-month debris recovery effort began. The remaining orbiters, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour, were grounded. More than 800,000 pieces of debris, including human remains, were recovered, mainly in an area that was about 320 by 16 kilometers in eastern Texas and western Louisiana. 
This totaled about 38,000 kilograms, or 38%, of the orbiter's overall weight. After laying out the recovered pieces in a hangar at Kennedy Space Center, investigators were able to better understand the cause of the accident. The accident board concluded in its 2003 report, after analysis and experimentation, that a foam strike on the left wing emanating from the bipod ramp was indeed the likely culprit of Columbia's destruction. The board also laid out a number of recommendations in order to prevent a similar tragedy from occurring. The most obvious was a redesign of the external tank insulation. Foam from the bipod was removed and heaters were added to prevent ice buildup in that location, for example. Moreover, a lot more cameras were added to the shuttle stack as well as on the ground to observe its ascent. For the spacecraft itself, a new orbiter boom sensor system was added to be used by the Canadarm to inspect the entire heat shield for all future space shuttle flights. More temperature sensors and accelerometers were added to detect breaches and impacts on the wing leading edges as well. There were also more contingency plans added, including the ability to repair tiles on orbit should it ever become necessary. Additionally, all future space shuttle missions would have an orbiter on standby to act as a rescue vehicle should it become necessary. That also meant that all future flights would be to the International Space Station. While that meant an initial cancellation of the final Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, that was later returned to the manifest. The accident report was also very critical of NASA's organizational culture, which it compared to the culture of the agency immediately before the Challenger disaster in 1986. The board said that a lack of a safety program led to the lack of concern over foam strikes, which NASA management did not consider to be a safety of flight issue. At the same time, NASA was experiencing budget constraints along with the pressure to maintain the assembly schedule for the International Space Station. Eventually, the program would recover and begin flying again in July of 2005 with the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. However, another substantial debris shedding event occurred during that mission, which led NASA to once again ground the entire fleet until that problem was fixed. While the return to flight mission returned safely, it would be another year before regular shuttle flights continued and the assembly of the ISS resumed. While NASA was working to return the Space Shuttle fleet to flight status, President George W. Bush made an announcement at NASA headquarters on January 14, 2004. In the past 30 years, no human being has set foot on another world or ventured farther up into space than 386 miles. It is time for America to take the next steps. Today, I announce a new plan to explore space and extend a human presence across our solar system. One of the criticisms by the Columbia Accident Investigation Board was the lack of any mandate providing NASA a compelling mission that requires putting humans into space. If you're going to risk lives, it has to be for a purpose. NASA needed a national mandate, something to focus its efforts on, something it hasn't really had successfully since Apollo. So President Bush laid out what would be called a new vision for space exploration to return humans to the moon. It would start by mandating the finishing of the construction of the International Space Station and retiring the aging shuttle fleet by 2010. In the meantime, NASA would start sending robotic missions to the moon in 2008 and develop a crew exploration vehicle by 2014. This would initially ferry astronauts to the ISS, but then be used to send people to the moon by 2020. The moon missions would then pave the way for Mars missions in the years to come. Ultimately, the space shuttle's last flight was in 2011 with the final ISS assembly missions a one-year delay from the Bush administration's mandate. NASA also sent the robotic Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to begin surveying the Moon in 2009. It's still there today. However, most of the vision for space exploration's initial incarnation, the Constellation Program, would ultimately be canceled in 2010 under the Obama administration, which cited a program that was way behind schedule and way over budget, something that didn't look good in an era of budget cuts during the Great Recession. Even so, many of its core components remained in development and eventually were pulled together into the current Artemis program. The Crew Exploration Vehicle, for example, also known as Orion, had its first mission to the moon, albeit uncrewed, just a few months ago. Using that same vehicle and rocket, a crewed lunar flyby is expected as early as the end of next year. Although it's been a roller coaster ride of space policy and budgetary processes over the last two decades, the sacrifice of the Columbia 7 has pushed NASA to return to deep space human exploration. As the Columbia accident fades further into the past, there is a real danger that many of the same conditions that led to disaster could begin creeping back. With the ongoing push to get to the moon, there are going to be budget constraints and schedule pressures. 
Combine that with a culture that might get too comfortable with certain risks, and you have a recipe for another disaster, this time potentially on the moon. So hopefully the lessons of crew safety culture that NASA learned and cultivated as it finished out the space shuttle program will continue as the agency, as well as its international and commercial partners, begin sending people to the moon in just a few years' time. Shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue to dream. I plan on doing a whole series about how we got from Constellation to Artemis. I'll link it right here when it's done, otherwise this will just be a video recommended to you by the YouTube algorithm. If you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing for more human space-like content or sharing this video with friends and family. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, Ad Astra.